Good morning. So just for a short moment uh, this morning, we're going to talk about the Sermon on the Mount. As you guys know, we've been kind of tracking through the teachings of Jesus, and um, we're going to talk about something that I'm not exactly an expert in, <laughs> and that's fasting. Um, and the reason why is because Jesus had mentioned it in the Sermon on the Mount there in Matthew chapter 6. And so the question is, um, or rather the topic is, when you fast, just as Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6, when you fast. And interestingly, he, notice he didn't say if you fast, but when you fast. Now, I, I was looking over this text, and this naturally fits into a section where Jesus is condemning the idea of living your righteousness out in order to be seen where he talks about fasting in a group of three uh, practices in their days, such as almsgiving and also prayer itself. Um, but I want to spend a little time talking about verses 16 through 18 there in Matthew chapter 6. And I, and I got to thinking, I was like, why is this text so difficult for me to grasp? I read a study recently. Uh, Nancy Hellick wrote in USA Today, she had written an article a while back, and she had noticed how these two researchers had looked over 52 different paintings of the Last Supper. And you guys know the one, right? Like where all the disciples of Jesus and Jesus himself are conspicuously sitting only on one side of the table. And we naturally think of Leonardo da Vinci uh, with the first Last Supper there. But they have tracked 52 different versions of it. And what they had found was super interesting that the portion sizes on the plates of these paintings have drastically increased over the past millennium. <laughs> it's just like Jesus' plate keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, right? And I think that's indicative of something, that uh, we like to eat, that that's the way that our culture has kind of, kind of grown into. I mean, you would almost think that a potluck is an article of the faith, right? Um, and so maybe that's why I think this passage is so foreign. Maybe that's why, when was the last time you heard a sermon on fasting, right? Um, I think the temptation is to eschew teachings that require us to embody the faith in any kind of way. And I don't know if it's because of any sort of anti-Catholic rhetoric that we lean towards or if it's something that seems kind of spooky or high church or maybe it's just something we don't really understand, but we... We've lost an edge in our faith in the sense that we don't want to do things that naturally embody our faith, right? And fasting is definitely something that does that. But just to push back a little bit, I want you to think about it this way. Think about the very first law God ever gave. Have you ever thought of it that the very first law God ever gave in the garden was a dietary restriction? And not only that, but then when you look at this text itself, the greatest sermon arguably, that's ever been preached by Jesus himself, the Sermon on the Mount, he mentions fasting. So go ahead and turn your Bibles there. It's going to be 811 in your pew Bible, and I'll start reading in verse 16. Let's see if we can challenge our minds a little bit. Jesus says, when you fast, when you fast, do not look somber as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show others they are fasting. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face so that it will not be obvious to others that you are fasting, but only to your Father who is unseen. And your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Real reward you. For as foreign as this teaching might be, this whole concept of fasting, here, in the Sermon on the Mount, the way that kingdom citizens live. If you even look in the not-too-distant past, I think you'll find that fasting was something that was practiced even more frequently than we can imagine now. Um, I read this, uh, this quote from one of Abraham Lincoln's speeches. And he says, Now, therefore, in compliance with the request and fully concurring in the views of the Senate, I do, by this my proclamation, designate and set apart Thursday the 30th day of April, 1863, as a day of national humiliation, fasting, and prayer. And I do hereby request that all the people to abstain on that day from their ordinary secular pursuits and to unite at their several places of public worship 
in their respective homes and keeping the day holy to the Lord and devoted to the humble discharge of the religious duties proper to that solemn occasion. And I'm thinking, man, I can't imagine that being, you know, <laughs> told to the nation today. It's a national day of fasting. We even fast as a nation. There was a time when it was assumed that as a Christian, you just fasted. But the question we're faced with almost immediately is this, is, is fasting actually a Christian practice? And I think the answer widely assumed everywhere in the New Testament is yes, it is. And so let's talk about this today. Yes, the short answer is fasting is a Christian practice because we are people who, like their Lord before them, are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, who say with the Lord, I have food that you know nothing about, and that is to do the will of him who sent me. And so the fact of the matter is, is that, like Paul Earnhardt says in his wonderful book about the Sermon on the Mount, quite frankly, we don't spend enough time in prayer and contemplation. We don't spend enough time in humiliating and, and humbling ourselves before God, and maybe we should. Maybe we should. So I have two points uh, briefly to consider this morning, how not to fast and then how to fast, four points each, and then uh, you'll be dismissed to your Bible classes. So let's go ahead and start. All right, so, so obviously the main thing Jesus is teaching in the text here is how not to fast, right? There's a certain way that was very popular in his day that people were fasting, and that was namely to be seen by others. It's like they're fasting, their beard is disheveled, they haven't put lotion on their face, they look pretty awful, and then whenever someone asks them, hey, what's wrong with you? He says, oh, I've been fasting for the Lord. They all of a sudden look around for applause, right? Like that, that's kind of what's happening here. And Jesus says here that fasting is not to be done to mainly be seen by others. He calls them hypocrites, play actors, because the heart behind fasting, true fasting, is a heart that's hungry for God. But these people are hungry for praise and adulation. Their act says, I love God, but their heart says, I love praise, and so they're faking it, all right? And it's, it's so easy to do this, not just with fasting, but with any good work, charity, reading your Bible, preaching, praying, uh, visiting the elderly, how easy it is to be religious whenever people are watching, right? That's, that's the idea. All right, here's the second reason not to fast, or how not to fast. We shouldn't be fasting as a strict requirement to be placed on all, as a sort of religious duty that is incumbent upon everyone. Many churches have made this mistake historically, right? Uh, but Paul wrote that the apostasy, this great departure from the church, would include those who depart from the faith who would, quote, he says in 1 Timothy 4, in verse 3, would forbid marriage and require abstinence from foods that God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. In other words, that a good theology tells us that God has given us food, that the earth is his and the fullness thereof, and so everything we have comes by grace through him. Not only that, but people will fast in different ways. For example, there are some who cannot miss meals for some health issue, right? Uh, even though technically it's, it's possible to go for a very long time without food. Uh, some even say 40 days, as long as you're watering yourself. Um, all right, the next one is fasting as asceticism. Turn your Bibles with me, Colossians chapter 2. All right, so we're going to take a, a brief departure from Matthew 6. Let's look at Colossians and consider what Paul has to say here. Start reading in verse 20. Since you died with Christ, right? He's just finished talking about being crucified with Christ through baptism. Since you have died with Christ to the elemental spiritual forces of this world, why, as though still belonging to the world, do you submit to its rules? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. These rules which have to do with things that are destined to perish with use are based on merely human commands and teachings. Such regulations indeed have an appearance of wisdom with their self-imposed worship, their false humility, and their harsh treatment of the body, severity to the body, but they lack any value in actually restraining sensual indulgence. All right, what's Paul saying here? Paul said we need to be wary of those who set up and enforce these man-made religious doctrines, such as particular fasts and self-abasement and severity to the body, uh, asceticism, in a word, extreme self-denial. And the reason why, he says, because many times, listen, those who th 
think they're submitting to God in subduing their flesh, even when we look at certain religious, uh, religions that are restrictive and self-abasing, uh, you know, they, they have this appearance of being more holy. But many times, Paul looks through that and he says, look, you're being just as indulgent. You're being just as indulgent. How? How can you be indulgent in restricting yourself from eating certain things? Because he says they may not be filling their bellies with food, but they're filling their hearts with pride over their religious accomplishments. Holiness is not something that can be merely imposed from the outside. It must originate from a heart that's transformed and come from the inside. And then finally, number four, the last way we're not to fast is to fast as a cloak, as a mere thing you put on the outside of a near that covers the fact that you're really not truly going to be obedient to God at all. Isaiah 58, in this great chapter, God is speaking through Isaiah, and he calls out his people for the ways in which they have substituted real, genuine obedience for religious ritual. And the whole chapter is about it, and it's very, very, very telling, but I just want to read a couple verses here in verses 5 through 7. Isaiah 58. He says, is this the kind of fast I have chosen? Only a day for people to humble themselves? Is it only for bowing one's head like a reed and for lying in sackcloth and ashes? Is that what you call a fast, a day acceptable to the Lord? Is not this the kind of fasting I have chosen? To loose the chains of injustice and untie the cords of the yoke and to set the oppressed free and break every yoke. Is it not to share your food with the hungry? And provide the poor wanderer with shelter when you see the naked to clothe him and not to turn away from your own flesh and blood. Then your light will break forth like the dawn and your healing will quickly appear. Then your righteousness will go before you and the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. Then you will call and the Lord will answer. You will cry for help and he will say, here am I. He's basically telling them, look, I, I don't want you to make yourselves more hungry that is a giant fly. Oh my goodness, man. This is the worst. Beelzebub. <laughs> okay. He's basically telling him, look, I, I don't want you to make yourselves more hungry and afflicted. I want you to make the poor less hungry and afflicted. That's the point. Sometimes we can get caught in doing a great many good and holy things, but almost as if to ignore other more important responsibilities to to cloak real good work that we need to do. God's saying, look, stop worshiping and obey what I've asked you to do. Fasting is never meant to be a substitute to real genuine obedience to God. In fact, no form of worship is a substitute for genuine obedience in our lives. All right, now that we've gotten that out of the way and the warnings, right, really hear the next point because I feel like some people are content with the first point and said, okay, well, I'm just not gonna fast, <laughs> you know, right? Like, we'll just avoid that one like that. No, we, we should have fasting as a practice in our lives, but how do we go about doing it, okay? How do, we, how do we begin to take it up? What are the principles? Real quick primer on fasting, okay? Why did they fast at all? Like, why would anybody rip their garments, shave their head, uh, keep food from their mouths? Why would they do things like this? These people understood something better than Westerners think because Westerners are, are talking heads talking to nodding heads, right? We separate body and mind very clearly, okay? That, that there's a difference between soul and body when really the Hebrew author saw us all connected, right? Holistically, that we're, we're embodied people. So therefore, their worship had to do with what they were doing. They were embodying that worship. And so here's just a few reasons why they would fast. Number one was to weaken and to subdue the flesh, to master their bodies, so to speak. They saw it as training in a way. Number two was to aid them or aid us and invigorate our prayer meditations. Number three was to humble yourself before God. It was a way of saying, God, I'm sorry, okay? I'm sorry, I, I'll keep myself from eating food. I want you to hear me in order to confess sin. And then number four, it helps us to prevent luxuries from becoming necessities, right? Or from the last supper plates getting larger and larger and larger. Now, I'm not preaching on fasting because I hate food, okay? I preach about fasting because I think it's biblical and because Jesus talks about fasting. And biblically, we're also called to eat with thanksgiving. 
Now, what's the difference between eating with thanksgiving and fasting? Here's the difference. I love what John Piper says in his book, A Hunger for God. He says, eating with thanksgiving is more rejoicing in the gift because of the giver, all right? So eating with thanksgiving is more rejoicing in the gift because of the giver. Fasting is more rejoicing in the giver himself, which means the bread magnifies Christ in two ways, by being eaten with gratitude for his goodness and by being forfeited out of hunger for God himself. Either way, we show Jesus to be the true bread of life. That's the point. So here are some reasons to fast. Number one, Matthew 9 and verse 15. Matthew 9 and verse 15. There, Jesus is being accosted by the disciples of the Pharisees, and they ask him, why do you and your disciples not fast, even though our disciples and disciples of John both fast? And he tells a story about how the new way that he is bringing things means that for the time being, while I'm there, while I'm the bridegroom with my wedding guests, they're going to rejoice in me and they're going to eat and it's going to be great. But there's coming a day when I'll be taken away from them and then they will fast in those days. We fast for the return of the Lord. We fast because he's not here right now. He's not with us. He's ascended into heaven. He's not here. And when you think about how Paul wrote about Jesus, I mean, he really longed for his appearing. When Paul could say, look, it's in Philippians 1, verses 21 to 23, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. And I want to hang out because it's far better for you that I remain here for you. But man, I would rather depart and be present with the Lord at home with him. Do you, have you ever spoken that way? That you would consider it better to be with Jesus in his presence? 2 Corinthians 5 eight, he said he would rather be away from his body and at home with the Lord. Fasting here then means that we are dissatisfied with the way things are. And we're not going to place our joy in earthly good, preferring rather to be filled with God, placing our joy in him, focusing our hunger for God, and recognizing that only he is the true bread of heaven. Nothing else can fill that void. It's a way to tell God, I hunger for your righteousness. Let the knowledge of you cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. Let goodness thrive and evil be judged. Renew and revive your church. Restore our dead and complacent hearts with the joy of your salvation. It's a way of saying that to God. And the ancients understood this, even though we might have fallen away from that idea. Another reason why we fast. Though Jesus looks to be saying that he's discouraging fasting in Matthew 6, He's actually saying, listen, if you do fast, I just want you to fast for the right reward, not the reward of human praise and adulation, but the reward of your Father. We fast for the reward of our fathers. And he says God will reward you. We fast to be filled up with God and his joy to possess a greater sense of his presence in our lives. You know, Jesus said, the first thing we are to pray for is that God's name be hallowed. We've talked about that before. Even unto the ends of the earth, that this kingdom would be consummated, that his will would be perfectly done on earth as it is in heaven. Do we long for that? Is that something that you want more than anything to the point that it comes out in your prayers and, and, and the things that you pray for? It's because we're, we're so filled with the world that we're satisfied and have no room to long for anything else. Another reason why we fast, thirdly, is to help overcome sin. I'm impressed by the fact that before the Sermon on the Mount, we're told that he is led after his baptism, Jesus is, into the wilderness by the Holy Spirit to be tempted by Satan, the adversary. And it says that he had fasted, right? He, he hadn't eaten anything for 40 days. And so in this mode of fasting and prayer, he dominates this trial, this temptation by relying on God through the weapons he's provided, which are fasting and prayer. I mean, this is so funny. C.S. Lewis actually believed that fasting could be a form of temptation practice now, right? We think about if we want to be good at anything, we practice, right? If you want to be good at a sport, if you want to be good at literally anything, you have to practice. You have to get your body to doing this to where it's almost second nature and habit. What about, what about conquering temptation? What about whenever your flesh rises in mutiny against you, wages war against you, says, no, I want you to do this thing, and you have to exert some dominance and control over that for the glory of God? Do we have practice for that? Or is it every time that we're actually tempted, 
and it's a life or death moment. We just fail over and over again. Lewis said that fasting would be a form of practice over our temptations. His reasoning was that if we, if we don't have practice in denying ourselves what is not inherently sinful, how can we be good whenever the time comes to deny ourselves in what is sinful? He says, I don't mean fasting and things like that. They, they are a different matter. When you are training soldiers in maneuvers, you practice in blank ammunition because you would like them to have practices before meeting the real enemy. So we must practice in abstaining from pleasures, which are not in themselves wicked. If you don't abstain from pleasure, you won't be good when the time comes along. It is purely a matter of practice. It's actually been kind of cool. Um, so you guys know every Sunday night, almost every Sunday night, we have the small group. And recently, uh, Ryan and Lydia have joined it, and they shared a practice with us that uh, they had been doing over at Creasy, Creasy Lane in the, the Church of Christ in Lafayette. And what the young people over there do is uh, we have this thing called group me, and it's like this group chat type of thing. And we started the practice where after all of our Sunday night devotions, we'll read a passage and we'll challenge each other to do something, right? And sometimes it's just simply to pray about whatever's really on the hearts and minds of those who are there um, in the group. And the whole practice has been, let's trade out something you would typically do in a day, like listening to music or watching a YouTube video or a Netflix episode or whatever it is that's, you know, that's indulgent that we just do in our everyday lives. Trade that out for a prayer. And what we'll do is we'll, we'll post an emoji into the group just to show that we've done this. Now, it's not a way to heap up any praise at all. We don't actually say what we've let go or what we've done, but it's just a way of encouraging the group to trade out doing something that's banal and, and regular for something holy, for something that lifts up the glory of God's name, for something for another person. It's basically like that. It's practice of trading out what is typical for what is God glorifying, right? That's all it is. Fasting, in other words, is a way to control self-indulgence, to practice self-control, to starve the flesh, and thereby desire, uh, thereby desire something greater. Lastly, last one, number four, we fast for the mission. Turn your Bibles to Acts chapter 13. I'm going to challenge you for a little bit, okay? Acts chapter 13. Just to show you this was something that the church did. The New Testament church of our Lord Jesus Christ did this. In Acts chapter 13, whenever there has been a new metropolitan-centered church started in Antioch, uh, where Barnabas and Saul will be laboring, and from there would start the mission towards the Gentiles. Um, notice what happens in Acts 13, beginning in verse 1. When Barnabas and Saul had finished their mission, they returned from Jerusalem, taking with them John, also called Mark. Now, in the church at Antioch, there were prophets and teachers. Barnabas, Simeon called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manian, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul, or Paul. And while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and then sent them off. There's something about it, and tell the truth, there's something about our church culture where we are very and deeply suspicious about anything that, that's like that. You put hands on people, that's spooky. Tyler, I don't want anything to do with that. Right? Or actually believing that the Holy Spirit is empowering the mission that we support monetarily for these four men all around the world. Right? Bob Buchanan, David Rodriguez, and Theophilus Bar Cartouche, and Henry Agutu. These people that we support to, to spread the church all over the world. But they were not so opposed to embodying their faith to really turn up the dials on their prayer life and say, God, we really want you to hear us. We are fasting and abasing ourselves in humility that you might hear our prayers to aid us in this mission to save people. If we have prejudices against that, we have to ask ourselves, why? How badly do we want God to hear our prayers? You look later on in the next chapter, Acts chapter 14, and verse 23. They're instituting elders. Paul says, through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. And before they institute elders there, before they place their hands upon these shepherds over the Lord's people, it says that they prayed and fasted. This was a New, Ter New Testament church practice. Apostolic approved example. And they're doing this because they want God to be with them. 
How badly do we want God to hear our prayers? Have we heard about some of the needs that are going on in other parts of the world? Maybe even the emails we have received about the flooding that's been happening in Sierra Leone. And we see that email on the list, and because we've just so, I don't know what the word is, maybe desensitized, we say, oh, yeah, I need to pray for that, and throw on the prayer list. This people got together, they knelt together, they fasted together, they said, God, we want you to hear us, and they prayed for them. How badly do we want God to hear our prayers? Biblically speaking, a good time for fasting is when anything serious is coming up or occurs. A big decision, a death, a sickness, a gospel meeting for the purpose of giving ourselves more purpose in prayer. Think about it. Fasting pay, played a part in the first missionary program that changed the face of the world. Are we that serious about reaching the lost? So, um, is fasting a part of our devotion life? Is it even an option for us? Have we even considered it? Maybe it should be. Maybe it should be. All right, I'll leave that for you to discuss. Uh, if I get any questions after, I will entertain those. Um, but uh, hopefully that's been helpful just as a primer for some of the things that were assumed in the days of Jesus whenever he taught in the Sermon on the Mount. Let's go ahead and go to God in prayer together, and then we'll have a scripture reading. Our Father in heaven, it is our deep and earnest prayer that you help us to come to know you through your son Jesus in a more profound and concrete way. Help us, O oh God, to strip away whatever prejudices we have living here in the Western world, any way that we've been taught to think about the scriptures and simply work through all of the muck that we might hear you afresh in your word. Challenge us, O oh God, to take up the practices of the ancient church. Challenge us, O oh God, to have a, the eyes of our hearts enlightened Help us to pursue you and to make do of any sort of tool that we can for your everlasting glory in the church. Almighty God, we, we want you to hear us. We want to pray and spend more time in humbling ourselves before you in prayer and contemplation and reading of your word. Father, help us to meditate on your glory and bless us with your presence. We pray this in Jesus' holy name, and amen.